Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, welcome back and thanks for joining us for episode 11 of Whelmed Season 4. My name is Rich and with me is my co-host Emily and producer Neil. Hey everyone, in these review episodes we'll be diving into the plots, characters, easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice and use all of that as a springboard to talk about creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes but we'll be discussing them in further detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. You don't have to prove anything to me, Trace! Who are you? I'm your boyfriend! You're a puppet. I'm your puppet boyfriend! And I'm your puppet mentor! <laughs> and I'm your puppet idol! Terrific! And with that, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title of this week's episode is Tegadare, which is Get Ready Backwards. The release date was December 16th of 2021. The in episode date was May 14th. The writer of this week's episode was Nita Chowdhury. The director was Vinton Hoik. And the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. Special guest voice credits this week are Tom Adcox as Clarion, Usman Ali as Khalid Nasur, and Muhammad Nasur. Erica Ishii as Mary Bromfield's sergeant and child. Eric Lopez as Blue Beetle and Billy Batson. Whitney Moore as Stargirl. Kevin Michael Richardson as Naboo. And Lauren Tom as 13, Tracy Thurston, and Jane Nasura. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode begins with another flashback. An unknown narrator explains that Arian, Vandal Savage's centuries-old grandson, was the first agent of the Lords of Order on Earth. And that, after his death during the sinking of Atlantis, the forces of order decided to reassess and keep an eye on Vandal Savage. After the credits and back in the present, Zatanna's magic team takes in the chaos left in Clarion and Child's Wake and decides they need backup. Zatanna sends Phantom Stranger and Jason Blood to track down more magical allies, while she and her protégés head to the Tower of Fate to meet with Naboo, who is none too pleased with their presence. In flashback, we see that 7,586 years after the sinking of Atlantis, Vandal Savage was ruling Babylonia. Vandal was frustrated with the independence of his generals, and when Clarion arrived uninvited, Vandal accepted his offer of help. Clarion's idea of help is apparently teleporting a star creature from deep space to mind control everyone around him, so, you know, that's fine. Back in the present, Satana tries to convince Fate to join them, but he refuses, saying that Satana's team of quote-unquote sentinels is not ready for the fight. The teens insist that they're more than ready, but to test them, fate banishes each of them to individual magical nightmare scenarios that highlight their fears and their insecurities. First, we see Tracy 13, who is faced with creepy puppet versions of her boyfriend, Blue Beetle, her mentor, Zatanna, and her idol, Beast Boy. While all three of them are encouraging and reassuring, a voice from the shadows keeps telling her that they're lying and that she's actually useless. When she goes behind the curtain to confront whoever's pulling the strings, she's faced with a towering version of herself. In a flashback, it's revealed that Starro successfully mind-controlled the Babylonian army, but only exerted its own will, not Vandal's. And in the ensuing battle, Vandal's son, Naboo, was killed, drawing the attention of the Lords of Order. Back in the present, Holland's nightmare scenario plays out with his being caught up between different worlds and different expectations. His studies to become a doctor and his work as a superhero, his inherent magical abilities and his Muslim faith, his mother and his father, until he is literally drowning in doubts. And in Mary's magical test, she is confronted by a younger version of herself who begs her to say Shazam and use her full powers again. When Mary refuses, her younger self transforms into Sergeant and attacks her, insisting that Mary is both too weak and pathetic to wield her true former power and not adaptable enough to work as a magical practitioner instead. In flashback, we learn that after Naboo's death, the Lords of Order recruited his soul revealed to him the true dangers of Vandal's alliance with Clarion, and then bonded his soul to his old helmet to create a new Lord of Order fusion on Earth, Dr. Fate, and his helmet of fate. Back in the present, Tracy confronts her insecurities and acknowledges that she lives with her fears and anxieties every single day, but refuses to let them stop or control her. Meanwhile, Khalid acknowledges all of the complex parts of his identity and heritage, that he is a man of faith, a man of mysticism, science, and that 
While he may struggle with doubts, these disparate parts of him do not need to be in conflict, and he creates his own path. Finally, we see Mary's confrontation interrupted by a young Billy Batson who reminds her that the reason she stopped being sergeant in the first place was because she was so addicted to the power that she wasn't living her life as Mary at all. With all three heroes having worked through their issues, they reappear in Fate's living room. Despite them each proving themselves, Fate still refuses to intervene in the battle between Clarion and Child. Inside the Helmet of Fate, it's revealed that the flashbacks we've been seeing along the way are a story being told by Naboo to Zatara to explain why there is no need for Fate to enter the current conflict. Zatara refutes this by reminding Naboo teamwork and cooperation are so essential to keeping order that they were built into the helmet's very design. Naboo and a host working together, drawing on each other's different strengths. However, Zatanna and Fate's conversation is interrupted by Clarion appearing at the tower's front door, begging for help, only to be followed by Child, who kills Tikal, thus banishing Clarion from this mortal plane. And in our post credit scene, in credit scene, during credit scene, there's a bunch of kids on a bus screaming. For That's reasons all. unknown. <laughs> it's just we'll screaming. Get to it. So much screaming. All right. Aster. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. Let's do this. Emily, what you got? What do I got? You want to talk about how much you love Vandal? Okay. So <laughs> I realized I went in, uh, I, I went pretty strong on saying that I'm frustrated <laughs> with these flashbacks. And I am. But to clarify, I don't, I don't hate learning all the lore and I don't hate like learning the mechanics of magic on the show. Those are cool i like them in a lot of things i like my fantasy novels i like knowing how the world functions i think part of it i think part of why it frustrates me in this context though is because young justice episodes are only half an hour at the most and so it feels like there's just so little time to tell a lot of really complex interpersonal stories even with just our main cast that sometimes it feels like there's just there's not enough space for me to have a whole magic history lesson. I'm sitting here worried about Zatanna and about all of these magical teenagers. And Naboo wants to sit me down and be like, okay, but 7,000 years ago, this one guy did a thing. And I'm like, I don't, do I care about him though? I do. I remember sitting in this and particular that's great episode. for you. <laughs> in this particular episode, thinking like, there's a lot going on in this episode. There's a lot of information, multiple scenes, multiple points of view situations and i was particularly in this episode i was like man they did a good job getting all of this information in and having it all be like relevant and character focused and forward and kind of an important information and explains to me for me a lot about like why is clarion doing like why is he even there like why does he even listen yeah. to vandal like he's not just your super villain of the week the the kid is somehow this Lord of Chaos, infinite elemental being, and also registers as eighteen or less than eighteen years old, so he can split the worlds. That's chaos. And I, w- I will say, I do think this episode breaks up those flashbacks and everything else that's going on better than yeah. the previous one that really frustrated me because it because it feels like everything ties together more in this episode because it is still about the helmet of fate and the helmet of fate is playing into the actual plot line that we're dealing with right now and stuff sure, like yeah. it feel it feels more relevant than some of the other flashbacks we've had yeah and i don't want to dismiss what you're saying because you're right there's a lot of information there's a lot of stuff going on in the background with vandal in each of these episodes as well so i can i can see how you know it can lean in the other direction which is like this is this is a lot and you're kind of a teen superhero nonsense focused person. And like that, that's, that's what you, you want. You want to, I, I, I like to know more about, I want to hear more Eric Lopez. So like, I want to know more about Tracy 13 and blue Beatles relationship too. Like he's there's a lot. Fantastic. I know. Rewatching so the episode. I was like, he's having so much fun. Oh, so yeah. much fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm, a, puppet. Same thing. <laughs> I'm a puppet. Yeah. I'm a puppet. <laughs> puppet my boyfriend. You're great. I'm your puppet boyfriend. I can, you can hear him like his voice kind of peaks a little bit there at some point because he's just having, you can tell he's got the biggest smile on his face. <laughs> As someone who is also an actor, I love watching things <laughs> where I can just be like, oh, this person is having the most fun and it's so fun to watch them have fun. I, 
I think we're going to do this review, but that, that, um, what was it? Season 3.9 episode they did. Oh, yeah. Where they, they had everybody on screen for whatever the DC Dome yeah. Presents thing was. Yeah. Oh, like my God. DC gosh. Fandom. <laughs> watching the, radio watching play. the other, watching the other, like, watching the other actors, like, trying, trying to hold themselves together when Nolan North is, is like, just like doing monster mala or whatever he was doing oh, yeah. and going going full gorilla and everybody you could see everybody just trying to he's just getting into it they're just all trying not to laugh out loud it was the great. radio play <laughs> is also fantastic because it is clearly like they got who they put together who was going to be available for that and then they just picked whatever villains those people also voiced <laughs> And we're like, they're the villains because you're the <laughs> actors that we have, and it's fantastic, and I love this. <laughs> and there's like that whole that whole, whole scene where it's just Crispin Freeman talking to himself yeah. with Captain Boomerang and and Roy or Will. <laughs> it's funny. Anyway, yeah, yeah, you could tell that's Eric's a whole having, different having, episode. Yeah, you could tell Eric's having a really good time in this episode. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to see. Yeah, we, if we didn't have these flashbacks, then we'd have more time to be able to doing those other things. But really the answer is more young, justice. more comics. Yeah. Uh, just more all across the board, you know, more, there's, there's a lot more young justice in all forms, but you know, I'd, I'd take a two part story where Tracy 13 and blue beetle go on an adventure together. <laughs> yeah, totally. What else you got? Other notes include, um, I, I deeply love Zatanna being just fully unfazed by Dr. Fate at all times. It's very, very good. It sets up her character in comparison to these magical teenagers who are like, what do you mean we're in the Tower of Fate? Who is this guy? We got to prove ourselves. And Zatanna's like, I am tired. I don't like being here. I do not like this man. <laughs> no. You know what? And I have this, I have this theory that using the, using the Ankh to get there, it wipes her out because she hates that thing. Yep. Like she's just literally like her whole body is just like, like her body and her spirit and her heart are just fighting. Like the fact that she has to deal with this guy at all. That's what it feels like. It just takes so much out of her. Well, I imagine the other end of that equation isn't stoked about the process either. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. yeah, you want to use it? Then go ahead. It's over there. You know, well, how do I, how do I, no, it's over there. You could use it. It's fine. No, yeah, go figure ahead. it out. Like, well, They're okay. all just fighting each other in circles. <laughs> uh, I also have, this is my random uh, comic book knowledge fun. In fact, that ties into this. We were talking about how Tracy 13's uh, Nightmare Scenario manifests as puppets for unknown reasons. In the comics, Zatanna has a really bad fear of puppets. That's a thing in the comics. <laughs> There's a whole issue about it in the 2010 Zatanna series. I read this ages ago and had to remind myself, I was like, why Why do I think there's a connection between Zatanna and puppets? Because I read it like literally almost 10 years ago. Man, I had- over 10 years ago now. I love the idea that that would that it would echo out of the conversation we just had. And like, does fate choose to use puppets just to be mean? Because like Tracy Thirteen didn't seem to have a problem with him. Like it wasn't like Tracy Thirteen's terrified of puppets. Yeah. No, they're just there. And let's watch the puppets like terrorize one of Zatanna's students mm-hmm. and watch what happens to Zatanna. Nice Zatanna, who's just grumpily standing there in the living room, being like, "Why do I have to watch this?" I've had creepy puppets all week, and then I just I I watched this episode again like, a couple weeks ago, and then I watched it this morning just to see if I missed stuff. And so I'm like, "It's puppets again," and because yesterday or day before yesterday, one of the kids that we teach, we teach homeschool classes for the local community now. One of the kids we teach was talking about Five Nights at Freddy's, um. and I was like, "I was like, what?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, I love that movie," and I'm like, "Uh." what what and then Meg's like what is that and i'm like it's like chuck e cheese like awful yeah. horrifying animatronic it's every nightmare about animatronics you've ever thought of so chuck e. cheese. i've never yep. seen it i won't watch it because it's just it's already i just watched the trailer and i'm like i have nothing to do with this and then i just watched like there's some doctor who specials that just came on disney yep. and one of them has a whole little creepy puppet family with crumpet puppet babies that are yeah, uh, it's just it's it's like and we stop and then we watch just this morning I'm like, oh, my God, the puppets are in this one. Uh, Doctor Who will scare you out of left field like you've never been scared before. And then it's be just like, yes. and just or just so super much fun. joy. I got a yeah, screw- I got crazy Who. screwdriver. Also, I haunt your nightmares now with them statues <laughs> that are keep oh looking my God. at but them. But Doctor Who, 
will also provide the extremely cathartic experience of someone kicking a creepy puppet across the room because that's what it deserves. Yes. And that happens. Donna actually grabbed the puppet and beat it to death. And I'm like, okay, thank you. I kind of needed that. That was great. But yeah, I'm just like, oh, so much with the puppets. I hate puppets and I, I and little creepy kids. Yeah. It was blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Yeah. I'm never the one with the comic book fun facts, but this time I know one thing. <laughs> Other notes. I, this time around, laughed quite a bit at Nabu and Zatanna talking about how such hosts were not always easy to come by. And I'm like, yeah, except for that one six month period where uh, three different teenagers all agreed to put on the helmet of fate because their friends were in trouble. <laughs> like three different people who all children were like, you know what? This is my best option right now. I'll agree to whatever. Well, <laughs> well, they couldn't keep it. Although Cal- Calder, though, I'm still just like, oh, he totally should have stayed on Calder's head. Like Calder yeah. was probably the absolute best choice for anyone. I'm like, he's got the strength. He's got the skill. He's got the endurance. He's got everything. But anyway. But he also has a life, Rich. He should be allowed to live. I know. I don't want him to be in that. I didn't say I wanted him to be. I'm just saying. But uh, connected to this, too, so they show up in, quote unquote, Fate's living room, right? And then Holland's like, oh, that's Aunt Enza, right? Yep. I'm like, okay, cool. So that's Aunt Enza, which means, because he's related to Kent Nelson, right? But Fate, it currently isn't Kent. So are there just rooms tucked away in the Tower of Fate that are the rooms created by previous hosts? Because I would like that haunted house tour of like who the previous hosts all were and what their like a uh, uh, chill take five room looks like. Yes, I, I simply agree to all of this. OK, because I'm like, why did they go there? It, it wasn't because of fate, because he's Zatara right now, but like because of Holly, maybe. Well, so so he's like why that room. He's the grand nephew is like what it was in DC. So I don't know if that's still like the because like I you know I never called anyone my grand uncle. Um, he was just Uncle Bill. Um, you know, so I don't think that's like a common term. So I would assume that based on you know napkin math in my head about ages, I would assume that that's probably true because of how long Kent lived. That's I true. would assume that he would probably still be the grand nephew in Young Justice as well. My kids have a granty. We call her granty. Granty Nancy. And I have been called a grunk a grunkle. I, I, I have been called a grunkle on several occasions myself, because I am now a great uncle many times. So yeah, Grunkle Rich. Yeah. It's just I, the only thing I can think of is it reminds me of Grunkle Stan from Gravity Falls. And Grunkle Stan's a fascinating human being that I <laughs> don't necessarily want to be associated directly with. But anyway. Getting <laughs> getting back to the Tower of Fate. I would point out, didn't Kent Nelson live for a while in the Tower of Fate, but not out as Dr. Fate? Mm-hmm. A long time, apparently. So it might just be that, like, Kent having spent a decent amount of time just actually living as a person in this space might be the only one who, like, has a setup, like, of rooms that he would use. Because I don't think. Because despite us loving to joke that, like, Dr. Fate watches Jeopardy every night in his little Dr. Fate living room, uh, I feel like Dr. Fate I'm doesn't sorry, use you mean that the, room. The he canon, just has it. The canon that that is? That's yeah. not canon, right? <laughs> but, like, he might just have this room and not use it. Um, and it might just be that, like, Kent Nelson is, that like, Zatanna doesn't have, not Zatanna, that Zatara doesn't have an equivalent like he may not have designed anything i want to believe that everyone who's ever worn the helmet and spent time in the tower of fate gets to start designing rooms i want to believe but it gets into that whole thing like that sucks because like i think in the comic a lot like kent nelson and the others they spend time as a human they spend time with the helmet and they do the job and blah 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 yeah it, it no joke that Zatara's is like yeah i've been your prisoner for 10 years like, this costume doesn't even have a zipper, man. I got to go to the bathroom. Like, it's been 10 years, and I get to take the helmet off one hour every year. So you're right. He wouldn't have a room. He doesn't get to be part of the process voluntarily. It's It sounds even worse than anyone else. 
Well, I think it's the first time. I think it's the first time you've had that deal, though. And so he says, "Cool, we made that deal, and I'm going to use the deal." I mean, you're literally using it. Like that's why he looks so old. You sign the contract, especially because like Kent Nelson's like, "Oh yeah, I'm 111 years old or whatever," and he and it's the helmet of fate helped him live a really long life, even though he hadn't worn it in what did he say, 60 years or something like that. But somehow in 10 years, the tar looks like he's 90, 80, 70. He certainly was, what, probably 50 when he put the helmet on. He He's looking rough. So, And it's like, and people wonder why Zatanna wants to fist fight Naboo in a Denny's parking lot. <laughs> like, of course she does. I mean, if you're <laughs> going to do it, if you're gonna this do is the it, worst deal. The internet has taught me that the two actual op- options are the Waffle House or Walmart, but <laughs> it used to be the Circle K, but now they've 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 changed it now. Yeah, something something's afoot at the Circle K. This episode is the episode where we just reference everything else. Yeah, yeah, because we don't do that at all. <laughs> we do I just feel like we're doing a extra. We are. Um, I was actually going to say something about the TARDIS and the Tower of Fate, but now I'll I'll skip it. I was I was thinking Thanks. that too, but I didn't say. <laughs> Because that is goes. one of my favorite uh, random things about the TARDIS of just the implication. There's a bunch of other rooms. Um, yeah, that just I exist. Found a pool. What? Yeah, it's down by the pool. So yeah, <laughs> it's Doctor Fate definitely has a pool or an ocean. That could be a thing. Aquarium. We need this tour, haunted house tour. I agree. One comic, one comic, Greg. Just one comic. Or haunted house tour of Doctor Fate's tower. 200 page uh, graphic novel. Yeah, either one. Because there is there is actually, uh, to try and tie this back and this stuff, there is a DC Comics for Young Readers graphic novel called Zatanna and the House of Secrets that is a s- sort of similar idea of Zatanna having to explore the House of Secrets that her dad is in charge of as a young Zatanna like, realizes that her dad and she both have actual magical powers. She has to team up with Clarion. It's a very cute little uh, graphic novel. She, but she has to team up with like, because I can see Rich's face of like, oh no, teaming up with Clarion. She has to team up with like, I was like, that's Clarion, not great, but, great until that last oh, yeah. line. <laughs> <laughs> no, minute. but it's Clarion for, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's Clarion for kids. It's Clarion Clarian. written for kids. So okay. he's just like, he's like a mischievous little elf kind of vibes okay. and like and there's kind of there's an energy of like maybe clarion doesn't want to be evil maybe he just needs a friend like zatanna and maybe he can grow and change and it's about friendship and like learning and being good. it's a good it's a cute little comic uh recommend but yeah it does have some level of like zatanna exploring a weird house with a bajillion rooms that all have weird stuff going on in them precedence so Almost. So there is precedence. Now we just need the Tower of Fate. Let's do it. Neil, what notes do you have? I'll hand it off to you so I'm not just going over everything. What do you got, Neil? Well, the first one I thought you would appreciate. Um, we the like Basically, the first line is, we are so moded. Because, um, again, <laughs> like that just lexicon of the team. Uh, and I also wonder, like, Jason Blood and the Phantom being like, yes, we're happy to leave together. We don't understand what, what you teens are, are speaking. I like the implication that that Phantom Stranger and uh, Jason Blood in this scenario you've written just assume that it's weird teen slang and not that it's <laughs> just localized to this group. They've been around for Kids a while. These both days. of them. I mean, because, yeah. well, yeah, because Jason Blood has been around for hundreds of years, and then the Phantom Stranger is the Phantom Stranger. So the spells yeah. are. This was probably the easiest one. It's very. It's rare that on like first listen, I can pretty much figure it out. Um, but when most of the spell is the title of the episode, um, yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a big help. So the first one is get camera ready. Um, so that's how she um, gets, you know, changes from being uh, dunked in a river. Uh, and the second one is father guide our journey through fate's holy onk. So there you go. OK, I don't have Rich. I don't have any answers for 7,500 for that number. Yeah, um, I can this give is- <laughs> you tinfoil hat theories. Uh, what if it's a birthday? I'm not sure whose it would be, but if you were 7586, uh, I don't have 
literally anything else. The only ask Greg I found was someone putting out all these dates uh, and Greg's response being, I don't know where you got those dates. They don't look like my timeline at all. So, uh, <laughs> great. Yeah. So there's this random where we're talking about, cause did I say, I can't remember if I said anything when I was reading it, but yeah, 7,000, 7,586. It's a very specific number. And I'm going to double check it again, but we were you know, like, is that a, is that a square root of 16 or does that divide by 16 somehow? Like how it certainly doesn't divide by, well, let's see. Nope. <laughs> that doesn't work. So it's just a very specific number for Young Justice for it not to mean something, but we haven't been able to find anything about it yet. So if anybody else has any ideas, shoot us an email. Especially to track forward from the fall of Atlantis. Unless that's, unless that's like where more concrete dates are starting in the timeline would be my other thought. Um, before that, you have, you know, 16 billion years ago and like really, you know, larger, n- rounded numeric numerics to represent those dates but like does the fall of atlantis happen on a certain year and at that point then you can determine okay then this happens on this year um is that like, yeah you know recorded history actually starting i don't know it's I, i've moved on i'm fine i'm fine it will just haunt me every day uh rich did you ever watch the live action shazam show in the 70s from the 70s in the seventies, all the time, that him driving around with that RV and Billy Batson was like seventeen years old or something. Well, that is uh, played by a thirty-year-old. When you're in Mary's flashback, it shows the immortal elders, um, and like basically, it is definitely just a redrawn version of the set, that show from the seventies. Really? Yeah, I looked at I looked it up. Oh, uh, I want to take a look at that. Yeah, great. Yeah, they are identical. Oh, I didn't. I didn't know. I, I mean, but I, wow, that's fascinating. You know. I did not catch that. Yeah, and I wasn't sure if it was like identical, but no, I actually like paused it. And no, it's a total redraw, but very similar to um, that scene. I'm gonna have to go take a look at that again. That's cool. Um, the thing that I was thinking of too was they refer to her as Sergeant, right? Yes, just Sergeant. Yes. So that means that the whole the whole Marvel thing. So now it's not Captain Marvel anymore. He has to be Shazam. So I was like, oh yeah, I guess they have to take Lieutenant Marvel and Sergeant Marvel. They have to take the Marvel out of all of them. So now they're just Captain. No, they're just Shazam. Ha- Sergeant, Lieutenant, Corporal. No, if I'm remembering correctly, if I'm remembering correctly, I think the thing that. Uh, Greg said one time in an interview or something was that when they did season three, they weren't allowed to call him Captain Marvel anymore because of legal reasons with Marvel comics, but because they didn't want to just switch the name, they just never refer to him by name in season three. So I think I'd assume that it's, he's now called Captain Sergeant and Lieutenant. Like, I think that's what they've gone with that. None of them are Shazam. Because that raises the problem of you can never introduce who you are without accidentally doing the thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. But she could have said, like, earlier there was a thing where she was trying to explain something. Explain, like, who she was or what she could do. Oh, yeah. Or, the like, powers of, and then she couldn't say it. Yeah. And she couldn't say the powers. She couldn't say, like, the powers of the captain. She didn't say, she didn't happen to say that. So that's why I was thinking of like, oh, that's should, fair. It must be go by Shazam. I t- I always took that as like there that all three of them have the powers of Shazam. Like that's what it's called. Oh, yep. Not as, as the wizard. you have the same power. Like, yeah. Yep. Nope. I can see that as well. It's an umbrella term, not a name. Right. Oh well, yeah. Because does Black Adam doesn't shout Black Adam? He's he shouts Shazam, right? No, that's what I, that's that, no, yes, that's my point. That was the point, right? To, to echo <laughs> Emily's point. Are you ready? I'm ready. This whole time, had we thought about it, I mean, I guess technically we couldn't have used it until this episode. This whole time, they have a name. She refers to them as her Sentinels, and that is a thing from DC Comics: the Sentinel Sentinels of Magic, with such people as Alan Scott. 
Billy Batson, Bloodwind, Blue Devil, Dead Man, Doctor Occult, Enchantress, Hector Hall, Holland, Madame Xanadu, Mary, Maybe Marvel, Phantom Stranger, Ragman, Raven, Sebastian Faust, Tempest, Tracy Thirteen, and of course, Zatanna. You got magic. Wow, that's a, that's You're quite in that a team. Group. It is quite a team that was only brought together in the 1999 event, Day of Judgment. So they were in Ragman. one, That two, was the one three, that got me, four, I think. Five comics. Yeah. They're too powerful to be in any more than five comics. I will say, I feel like at some point in writing these outlines, I remembered that they eventually start being called the Sentinels. And I just thought it was more fun to keep making it's way up more names fun. for them. Oh, yeah. Making up names, yeah. Was Swamp Thing on that list? No. He's got different magic. It is an invalid team. Uh, he does, he does, does he cast spells, Rich? Would you like to call him out on that to his face? No. No. No one does. I was just saying. It's a different kind of magic. He fits in a different category. He's basically the Earth. So, you know. He's above being on their team. He doesn't need to be on their team. You know what, though? You're not wrong. He just wants yep. to chill in the woods. <laughs> He's like, leave me alone. <laughs> I got smash. my trees. Uh, he's got his trees. He's trees. got his girlfriend, and that's all he needs. <laughs> that's all he needs. All right. What else you got? So there is a whole lot in this episode. Uh, there's actually a whole subplot that we have not touched. We can touch on it in a moment. But one of the things is like during those, I don't know. N- do we call them Nabu nightmares? I don't know. Oh no. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, we do. Okay. Well, no. We now. Um, I mean, so it, but basically you have a lot of religious references and one of the biggest ones, um, for those who may not know, uh, and huge shout out to cast crew and everyone in between for really doing the legwork to get the right people involved in those conversations to make sure it landed the way it was supposed to. Khalid sings or hears himself sing it's kind of hard to tell with the echoey nature um of nabu but basically he hears the adhan which is the call to prayer uh and then the call and response afterwards of may peace be upon you and then may peace be upon you as well um but the other one that comes up that i thought was really good and is very very hard um to pick out is your note Emily, your your final note. Yeah, uh, in a later scene when uh, Zatara is talking to Nabu about how his faith has gotten him through being in the helmet for 10 years, he recites the Our Father, and you can actually hear, if you're listening, that you can hear like the preemptive echo of the helmet is just the Our Father, but in Italian, uh, and that's very cool. Yes. Which is a detail you'd miss if you aren't listening for that helmet echo, and also just a detail you might miss if you don't, (laughs) if you don't know Italian, or if, like me, you did not go to Catholic school for a very long time and just know what that sounds like. Yeah. So I have a question that I don't think either of you will have an answer to unless we go listen and come back later. It doesn't sound like Zatara saying it. Like it that doesn't? echo doesn't sound like him. It doesn't. It oh, you mean in Italian? Me. It the Italian echo, mean, and it could just be that it's it's in Italian, and maybe that's and it's that preemptive echo, and maybe that's what's messing with my ears on this one. But for me, for some reason, it didn't sound like him. But it could just if be that we just start watching these episodes too many times, and my brain just starts going all kinds of places. Yeah, I mean, it could be, it could be. I him. thought so it was a him. whole bunch. There's a whole bunch of things that it could be. So it could be him saying it in his like native Italian, right? That he grew up on. It could be him remembering back when he was like a kid or younger, and somebody reciting that to him in Italian and doing that thing. There's a whole like a. Uh, it just feels like there's a whole lot there that's not just like, oh, hey, by the way, I'm Catholic, right? Like, or no. I'm, I'm I am a Christian faith of some sort, right? It's not. It's not just they didn't just try he's, and tack it, tack it on. Right. Well, I'm just saying, like, in, in, in some other, like, they took the time, like you're saying, like, this thing that shows will do where they're just like, oh, okay, we'll, we'll throw a thing on there. They're wearing a cross or there's some un, unidentified, you know, Christian denomination 
you know, and here it's like, no, this is a character and this, this faith is important, so important to him. It's kept him alive for 10 years, but that there's yeah. a real connection to his history and his past in the same way that Hollywood's talking about, like to his mom who says like, I gave up magic, you know, when I became a Muslim, that's the, I'm interested to see where that's coming from. Like, what is, what is that? As a descendant, for, like a direct line descendant of those that came over on the Mayflower, mind you. Right. Um, exactly. And- which, I mean, at the end, I think it was, you know, when the episodes first came out, there was a lot to be said about, or a lot of conversations about ah, people maybe not enjoying this this whole thing as much, or the religious overtones. But at the same time, like now that I've sat with it more, rewatched it several times, it's just a really solid example of what it's like to just be a complex individual. Um, yes. Because he's literally, like, if he said nothing more than the single sentence of, um, first first generation immigrant and s- direct lineage to the Mayflower as his yeah. parentage. Like just yeah. that sentence alone shows the complexity. Not only to layer, you know, to layer in the idea of science related to him be, you know, studying to be a doctor as well as the magic. Then you cross over to Zatara having a deep seated. Christian faith, as well as all of this magic. And then you transfer back to bad luck magic, urban magic. You transfer to um, the immortal elders and getting power from them, but then also leveraging that power in a completely different way. Um, and I think it's just now, like I said, that you know, removing myself from those conversations and watching it again, it's just the realization that like it's really just showing how complex people can be. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And not everybody is not everybody's like, oh, if you're a this, then you must be like this. Right. If you if you are of this particular religion or background, then you can't believe these other things. Right. Like there isn't again. We're not flat two dimensional beings. We're complex and have not not even just to mention his that's all his lineage. And then just about his personal day to day life, just being a complex human being, you don't have to have that kind of complex lineage just to simply live your life and, you know, have made mistakes, said the wrong thing, said all the right things, done the right whatever's, you know, have life happen to you and have conflicting experiences in your mind about truth and try to figure out what those are. You know, I, I love this episode and I thought it was, I thought it was amazing as uh, particularly from that standpoint of like, I mean, how do you, it's just a complex idea. Like you're talking about with Zatara, like you're talking about all that stuff that you just said and zeus is a thing you know like power of zeus mercury is a mercury is a guy you know mercury is like a like an entity that power is being drawn from so how does that relate to different you know judeo-christian religions and any other religion in the world as well like it's complex man and you layer in the lords of order and chaos who have a tangible presence in the world like very tangible i mean you're in one of their living rooms um having this whole this whole conversation right. and one's knocking and two of them were knocking on the door outside later on so i mean yeah yeah it's a, it's uh yeah it's a lot speaking of a lot <laughs> that's your that's your hand off <laughs> yeah i'm gonna do the bust later but the one thing that we haven't touched on uh that is this subplot that is real quick beast boy is having a worse time Ugh. hashtag and we'll get into beast it a mess but that's that's there. But we'll get it. We'll get into that more. Um, but yeah, I just dawned on me like that's just layered in the mix of all of this. Um, it's just yeah. checking back in on how that's not going well. But is also seeing those scenes rewatching this episode. I thought it's, it's interesting how like Zatanna is dealing with an apocalyptic scenario right now, and like literally just on the other side of the country, like the outsiders are just doing a routine mission, like. <laughs> Like this, this news has not spread yet. And that is an interesting point to be in, in this arc. <laughs> like, like, yeah, you know, that whole town lifted up and crashed back into the war, back into the ground. We got a mission. Condiment King strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> Who was this uh, time? Technically, Head- headmaster? This time it's the headmaster. Yeah, oh, yeah that's right. right. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. I, I got one more note. Scrolling back through my stuff that I don't think we've covered yet. I to go back to everybody dealing with their insecurity, nightmare scenarios, whatever we're calling them. I just think the contrast between 
the resolution for Mary's arc in this episode versus everybody else is just very interesting. I know we talked about these in our screen somethings, but I'm bringing it up yeah. again because I think about this a lot of how Tracy and Holland both find their strength in themselves and make a statement about who they are and how they're overcoming something like Leroy, Tracy's little lizard apparently like reminds and supports her. And that's what spurs her to make her statement. But she's still the one who knows what she needs and says it in that scene. But Mary has to have an outside force remind her why using her powers that way that she used to is a bad idea. She has to have Billy very literally spell it out to her and like intervene in this situation. And while having outside support is obviously not a bad thing, it is very good and it is a very important step in solving whatever your problems may be, especially in this case where Mary's uh, struggles are clearly very much framed as kind of a metaphorical addiction to power. Very good to have outside support. Very important. But it shows that she's just really not at the same place in her journey as the other two. Like, she doesn't actually know and believe her own worth yet. She has to have, she just has to tell herself that other people believe in her, which is an important step, but is not the final step. And like, it's also interesting noticing on this rewatch of seeing like how everybody else, how Khalid, Khalid and Tracy both say, I'm ready, like a nebulous acknowledgement of their growth and ability to face whatever the future has in store for them. And Mary specifically says, I am ready for this fight, which is like so fully focused on the immediate challenge and goal that's right in front of her which does not, to me, mean the same thing. And I do think it's intentional. Thoughts? I wonder if the only thing that pulled her out is basically her remembering a similar, if not same, conversation that Billy had to have with her. Yeah. And so you're just, re- and like, like you're saying, you're, you're, for her, it's not as much growth as it is addressing this immediate by retreading a conversation that had happened before rather than having more of that internal conversation with herself to really move forward in growth uh, like the other two did. And Billy says something like, and she agreed or something like that, or, you know, you agreed. Yeah. He says, you agreed that this was a bad idea. Yeah. You agreed that this was a bad idea. It's real subtle, but yeah, it's it's still an outside force. Like someone else came to you and said you should do this, and they said that's that's a good idea. That's not internalizing the choice or taking ownership or agency over the choice. So yeah, I think it's important that in, that intervention can be super important, and it can set you yeah, on the right sure. path. But it's it you can. have to grow and to really internalize that change. You have to also be the one who's like, no, I, I need to do that. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if this is going to come up uh, again later. Who knows, Rich? Yeah. Who knows? Hmm. We'll get to it. It's important. <laughs> uh, Neil, did you have anything else? Prepare yourselves for me watching the bus go through at maybe halftime speed. So I got to hear them. Oh, really? <laughs> I, in hindsight, I should have turned the volume off because then I just heard them <laughs> scream slowly, which is weird <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it because I could have easily turned that off. So we're already of the mind that the bus knows no bounds. Um, <laughs> that is literally how I wrote this note because it seems like space, time, dimensions all bets are off because it kind of does like three circles three or four circles and then it will go somewhere else these are my best guesses for where they go i think maybe it's just in space at the beginning but then it goes through these like weird kaleidoscope effects when it goes other places i'm fairly confident that one of them is inside cyborg's body Because it kind of looks like the Mobius tech when it's in his blood vessels. Then we transport to what I can definitively say is the source wall. Because if you slow it down, you can easily see the faces. So then they just go by the source wall for a hot second. Um, Then it's somewhere I absolutely in no way, shape or form can place. Um, Then it goes to where you can see DNA strands. And my theory is that it references back to when Bumblebee shrunk down at the end of season three to oh. mess with the DNA. 
Then it goes to what it looks like the ghost dimension, um, throwing back to all the granny goodness stuff. So there's a green planet, unidentified. It's the easiest one to tell that they're going towards it because um, it's not in that like really weird kaleidoscope effect. But yeah, they they fly to a green planet. Um, and dear listener, if you know what planet that might be, you should let us know because I don't. And I assume as soon as we're done recording, I will figure it out and then I will be sad. Great. <laughs> well, that's all I have for now. Awesome. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes we review. Once we get around to the bloopers, there will be a set of them that talks about the idea of narrative cohesion and a really elaborate idea that narrative cohesion should have been a Canary Debrief for every season that we've done. Uh, and while funny, it is something that holds true in the idea that the reason this podcast works is that it's a formula. Like we stick to it, we run through it. Basically, we became what we are and we've held true to that because that is the narrative cohesion that we as this podcast want to hold. Certainly things have changed along the way and adapted and grown, but by and large, the first episode is not that different from this episode. And if you look at Young Justice and take away the narrative cohesion that you see there, it's what makes your story flow smoothly and feel connected. I think about re-watching some shows from the mid-90s and characterizations were done at the speed of plot. That a character could be, a secondary character could be the closest confidant of a main character, one episode, only to be this huge sticking point in, a, in direct combat, be it physically or some other way, with that same main character. The sizes of a town could be different. The distance between two towns could just seem nebulous. The amount of technology that's in one episode to the next is different. It's a you know AM ham radios to cell phones to computers and horse and buggy all over the place. So... It's this glue that's between the sentences and paragraphs and scenes that you're writing that actually keep the reader engaged. You know, a lot of the things we talk about are things that done well, someone likely won't notice. I think a lot about that when I edit is that in theory, you don't hear a good edit. You will probably hear a bad edit and it will stick out. But if I do a really good job editing, it's not something you would inherently notice every time you listen to the podcast. So that's audio editing, which is not quite what we're talking about. But the idea that like reoccurring themes and arcs are really important. If you think like the overarching theme of teamwork, teams on teams on teams and them working together or work in doing all of these things together, it's one of those things. And the other is a, a lot about legacy and about leadership and there are these through points from, again, episode one, season one, to where we are now and throughout the entire series. With that also comes character connections. Even when missions separate the team, it's also about thinking, okay, what would this other character do? What should I do because I have learned from my mentor? Would all of these different things, especially if, oh, okay, I know these things because inevitably Batman has information on them. And doing that also allows for callbacks, foreshadowing, you know, the ability to look forward as well as looking backwards. Like once you have that narrative cohesion, you're afforded the ability to actually do these sorts of things. Coupled in with that is the consistent world building. I know we've brought it up before, but I, I realize the more we talk about this and the more I really sit with it. For me personally, and it can be certainly different for every viewer because that is the nature of the beast that is media and its consumption. But for me, if you set a rule, follow that rule. That's it. I'm done. Like, that's all I need. Just that consistent world building. Unless you have a reason why the rule changes that makes sense. It's not just changing it just because you need to this one time or it's easier or certain things, but having that consistent world building 
And as you can well imagine, especially in these arcs, as Young Justice establishes a detailed universe with its own lore and factions within that. You have these references throughout the show that make the world feel real and connected. You know, even the Erdell Initiative and all the things that tie back to that, but it is a single sentence. Emery is now working at the Erdell Initiative. That could mean nothing, but because of the show being what it is, there is so much more that can be behind it. And coupled with that, though, as much as it is important to have those larger timeline-based details, one of the really important things is the emotional continuity as well. So characters' emotional growth being a constant thread rather than this scattered thing. And it can be scattered, certainly, to some degree, but there needs to be a continuity that makes sense. And so, like, whether they struggle with the leadership in one episode might influence their actions in the next episode even if they're on a completely different style of mission. Going back to the thing I know I've said before, but the idea that if you create a world, one of the things to be able to do, and especially if it's a living world, like I think Young Justice is, your writing, your media, whatever version you have, is simply looking on a world that in theory would continue to exist with or without our ability to see it. So again, the quick hits, reoccurring themes and arcs, character connections, callbacks and foreshadowing, consistent world building, and emotional continuity to help you create narrative cohesion and let it be the glue that holds your story together. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season four, but in Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. And everyone is typing at the same time to add their notes. Sergeant Mary, this was this was like a big deal. Like a big deal. That she that she did not have her own agency. I mean, yeah. As as my note says above your note, uh, Mary struggling more with the test than any of the others shows foreshadows how this larger fight is gonna go down. Mary isn't ready. Mary thinks she's ready, but she's not, and that's gonna lead to a whole lot of problems, including being cut out of the Doctor Fate plan, going off on her own. Crying in an alleyway, getting abducted by an evil space force, becoming a supervillain. Mary's going to have a time and most of it's going to be off screen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we'll talk about when the episode comes around, too. But just, you know, when, when I watched it, I was like, man, yeah, I know she's got a thing. It's probably not a good idea if her be part of the group. But, man, it was bad out there. And she did what she needed to do and, and tried to do the best that she could. And I kind of see her point of view. And also, like, if you're that addicted to power, you definitely do not need to be sticking Naboo on your head because it's that then isn't going to come off anytime soon. Well, and, you, and there there could be a debate that she has the most powerful connection to something in comparison to the other options. Uh, yeah, my, that would be that would be my guess. If I was voting on who has the most potential power, it's her. Also, what what if Naboo's just like, hey, uh, did you know that there's a thing in this corner? Uh, I'll just have you say Shazam real quick. Let me take a look at that. See what that's all about. <laughs> oh, this is great. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. Echoing that, the note I had that needed to be moved down was Holland saying, uh, I'm not a doctor. And Zatanna saying, well, not yet. Not yet. And yep. <laughs> I didn't catch that until this watch of, oh, wow, Breaking yeah, no, no, wall. you're really, this wink. really, this, you got a plan here. Wink, wink. Is you had a be plan a for 24 hours. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you're still working on it. Yep. Also, this time through, I had a thing that I noticed in the, under the category of Beast Boys having a time, I have the sub note uh, from that. Of the this time through, I just realized that when Beast Boy is just completely zonked out, he's just asleep because he's been self medicating with sleeping pills, uh, and his phone goes off and falls off of his nightstand. Uh, is that supposed to be Perdita trying to call him before she shows up in an episode or two? Because I 
just realized that I think that's what that's supposed to be. She says something about like, I tried calling you. Or she, you're yeah, not doesn't she? Calls or- and I think I feel like I just never put together that we actually see the phone call not get picked up. <laughs> Uh, cause there's a lot happening in these episodes. Yeah, and the phone's face down, but I mean, I, I mean, if it's not, I mean, why? Any other version of it is just isn't fun. I mean, <laughs> oh, we just want to call you about your car's extended warranty. I mean, uh, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. 15 calls a day I get from yeah. San Diego mm-hmm. or Oregon. Sir, I'd I like to know. buy your house. But, and so, like, the, any other version of a call just doesn't make sense. But I think going yeah. to him in that moment, showing where he is at, and then having that call be the one from Perdita I, makes the most sense by far. Yeah. I think just watching these episodes, like, week to week for a while there, like, it never clicked that that was a thing that happened. Yeah. And I like it. Thumbs up. You know, watching stuff back to back, you're like, hey. I kind of would have liked to have had the phone be face up with like Perdita on it. Would have been interesting in the moment too. Yeah. Just, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Dropping that, dropping that hint. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to say something mildly controversial. That's not true. Oh, I don't, no. I don't actually think so. Okay. So at the end of it all, I mean, so child kills Tico. And I know that's a big deal, but I kind of wonder. Vandal, you just didn't choose to do that for a couple thousand years. You just didn't figure it out and just decide that's the route you wanted to go. Because he he felt it was uh, more useful to keep Clarion around than to stop Clarion. Vandal Savage has been fully convinced for many hundreds of years that he can figure out how to control Clarion. And that's part of the thing. Well, part of me thinks that that's necessarily now thinking back to one of our earlier conversations, that that's probably a two way street. I will say, I will say something twice, but you have to think about it different. Both of them would rather not fight with each other, but would rather fight with each other. Yeah, um, I gotcha. And the, yeah. And the yeah. idea that both of them have come to the conclusion that Clarence, like, I don't know. I just kind of can't kill him. I guess it'd be just more interesting to just kind of work with him they see what he's got going on yeah and yeah. there could also be a single conversation to say hey just so you know every other person might be worse see child yeah or yeah. the like there's also the argument to be made that vandal savage is smart enough to know that if he ever did kill tickle clarion's enemy for life it's like there's there's no coming back from that it's like you're never gonna work with that kid again because he loves his cat more than anything else. So he'd find a way to just, you know, recorporealize eventually and be like, yeah, time to ruin your life as best I can forever. Or, like, or yeah, or the replacement is completely and wholly worse. unwilling to work with you. Both of right. these things. And again, I say, I love Tikal. I know she's an evil cat. Gosh, I love cats. Makes me sad that we killed a big, scary cat. I like her. <laughs> It always makes me think, I mean, this is the RPG thing of like, I have a familiar, but it will, I mean, it it doesn't have very many hit points and I'm just terrified, but Clarion just seems to have that cat out in the worst of moments. You need, you need the fantasy Pokeball. Yeah. You dismiss it to uh, its own pocket dimension and when you need it, you bring it out when you're like, oh yeah, I have a familiar. (laughs) Oh, right. (laughs) Yeah. But I think that's it. I think we wrapped everything up. And with that, I think we can say to out of the Watchtower. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on our website, crashingthemode.com, and you can even email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on apple podcasts or your podcatcher of choice the ratings comments and subscriptions help others find the show if you do leave us a rating please let us know at our email address or on social media especially if you're outside the u.s as we have to look a little bit harder to find those if you are able to support us monetarily please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode even a dollar a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions interviews reviews and more and remember Stay well, Stay well, well everyone. everybody. You guys change speed every time. You've been listening to Whelmed, 
the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 